Good morning. It is good to see you. We got folks looking for a place to sit. Room for two? Right up here, right up here, right, right, right up here. Yeah. Now don't, don't anybody stare and look that direction. Just <laughs> keep looking at me, all right? Well, I don't want them to stand all service. All right, I uh, got another one. There's a, there's a spot right up here, single right up here. Come, come on up. Right, right here. There's, there's room right there. There we go. So, all right, guys, good morning. I survived high school camp. All right, I survived high school camp. If you were here last Sunday, you know, on uh, Friday afternoon, found out I uh, needed to be a counselor at high school camp. First time I've done that in 22 years, all right? And uh, it was great fun. I had a ball with them. I had some of the best boys you could imagine. Uh, I said it's a first. I remember camp when I had to go out looking for kids, all right, at night because they weren't where they were supposed to be. Half my cabin was in bed before I got to the cabin, all right? <laughs> I said, what, what have your parents done to you guys? All right, you're so nice. It was absolutely terrific. I actually even did with them the ropes course and zip line. All right, and I survived it, okay? Uh, I had to have a guy on each side holding my hand, but we got it, we got it done. It, uh, it was a great week of camp, and uh, in a week or two, we'll give you some updates on it. I will tell you this, New Hope can be very, very proud because we had a member of our youth group who out of 15 contestants won the belly flop contest of the camp, okay? It's the Rude's granddaughter, Cadence, all right? So Cadence, her first year at camp, first year at camp, she came away with a prize. Probably the number two winner, uh, second place, was probably a young man, Fawn's grandson, all right, from our church. He had the biggest red spot on him, all right? I mean, it was huge. What Cadence did was a one and a half flip landing on her belly, all right? She nailed it. I'm telling you, it got a 10 because she nailed it. It was impressive. I do have it on video. I might show it in a week or two, all right? I might show it. Uh, but anyway, uh, it, was, it was a great week. Thank you for praying. Uh, we survived. Um, there is a grief share sign up clipboard somewhere on the premises. If somebody can find it and bring it to me, that would be wonderful. Uh, let me talk about today. It is great to have the Actus family back in Clovis, California. All right. <laughs> I said it's great to have them home in the 8 o'clock service, and when I said that, I thought, you know what? They're leaving us in about five or six weeks, and they are going back to home. So it's great to have two homes, isn't it? Uh, but when they get to come back and be with us, we're so very excited. You'll be hearing from them a little later on in the service. You're going to get a small dose of them this morning. Then this afternoon, you can come back at 2 o'clock, or 3 o'clock, or 4 o'clock. Okay? Any one of those hours, only for an hour, from 2 to 3, 3 to 4, or 4 to 5, and in various rooms and locations on the church property, you're going to get to experience a village encounter. In different locations, they're going to give you a taste, uh, a little different taste of what it's like to be in a village in Uganda. And so you can come back, share that experience, and every single one of those village encounters at two and at three and at four, everyone is going to end with ice cream. <laughs> now I have a question. Do they have ice cream in Uganda? Yeah. In the village? No. Okay, so they're cheating just a little bit with the ice cream. But it's a way to draw you out on a hot summer day, all right? So uh, that's at 2, 3, and 4. And then the service at 5 o'clock tonight will be here in the sanctuary instead of in the bridge. And uh, they're going to share more in depth tonight. And they have a chance for uh, question and answer with them this evening. So this is Actus Celebration Day, all right, here at New Hope. And so we are so grateful they're here. Uh, so I hope you'll come back to the 2, 3, or 4 and again at 5 o'clock today, all right? Uh, please take note of the other things that are going to be happening over the next few weeks, uh, from uh, Widow's Lunch Bunch to uh, Men's Breakfast to Prime Timer's Luncheon uh, to the special movie night we're putting on on August the 17th. Our small group leaders are putting that on. Uh, Safe Families follow-up meeting. Last Sunday we had the representative for Safe Families in the Central Valley share with us. And uh, over 25 of you signed up that said, I would like to be engaged in Safe Families in some form or fashion. 
If you were not here last Sunday to hear about that, want to know more about it, you can show up at this meeting. What this is, is this is kind of like, a, this isn't foster care. This is, you would be willing to open up your house for two nights, three nights, four nights. The average stay is, uh, I think they said in our area was 11 nights, but some of them are as short as one, where you may take one or two or three children in for just a very short period of time. While a mom or dad or a mom and dad get back on their feet, go through a surgery, they have no family in the area, they have nothing to do with their kids, and often CPS gets called in those situations. Other ways you can help with safe families is you can provide support for the family in our church who is providing a place for those kids to stay. So you might buy them a gift card for the grocery store that week. You might come and babysit for an hour or two while they go to a doctor's appointment. So there are various ways. You might choose to be a mentor to a struggling mom. And so there's lots of different ways you can be a part of this safe family program in our community. And that's what the meeting on Sunday, August the 19th is all about. It will be right after this service over in the bridge. If you have invited Christ in your life, but you have never been baptized and would like to be, we're going to be having a baptism Sunday. Sunday, the last Sunday of August on the 26th. And so uh, take a card in the pew in front of you, put your name and contact info on it, and then check baptism. And this week we will get out the information to you, and then we will follow up with you uh, before that Sunday. Ladies, you have a special event coming up on Saturday evening, September the 1st. You have a special guest comedian going to be with you that night. She is absolutely hilarious. And it's a great time for the ladies. You're going to have a quilt. In fact, we'll put it on display play in a couple of weeks. It's called the Choose Joy quilt that Emma and her quilting team are putting together. And uh, there's going to be a, um, uh, a raffle draw. I almost said lottery. There's, <laughs> there's going to be a raffle drawing, all right, for that quilt uh, that evening. And there's going to be ice cream. You're starting to get a theme around here with the ice cream thing, all right? Men, man's camp, October the 19th to the 21st, Shaver Lake, a very casual event for guys. And I think there's even going to be ice cream. Uh, but uh, guys, put it on your uh, calendar and you can begin to sign up very, very soon. Uh, Sunday night after this week, actuses are here tonight for the remaining Sundays in the month of August. Uh, Mark is going to be preaching uh, out of the Sermon on the Mount, the cross-cultural message of Jesus. Counter counterculture. The things Jesus preached about then was peculiar to the folks who were listening to it. And guess what? It's still peculiar. <laughs> The message of the Beatitudes and other things that Jesus shared in the Sermon on the Mount are very counterintuitive. And so uh, Mark's going to take kind of a close look at some of those things over the last three Sunday evenings of the month of August. We hope to, to see you there. So those are some of the updates that we wanted to share with you. Uh, we are going to have our offering in just a moment, but I need to explain something first. The actresses are going to be up uh, uh, and speak in, in just a minute. Uh, in fact... Let's go ahead and do that right now. Did I do it before the offering last service? I did it after the offering? Let's do it before offering today. All right? So see what camp's done to me? It's got me out of my normal routine here. Uh, are you guys okay with that back there? Yeah, we're good. We good? Because you came out, did one, then they went, or did they do it? No, no, we did it before the message. We'll do it that way. So come on out, guys. Come on out, guys. Say hi to Tim Kepler. It was great to have Tim home from Alaska. All right. Good to have him home. Uh, enjoy him today because he's leaving for Japan on Friday. All right. Um, he was, he, he's going to Japan to do outreach work and worship work. All right. He's been going since 2000. All right. He gets, and uh, so making a difference in the country of Japan with the ministry God has blessed him with. He was not in Alaska for ministry purposes, unless, well, he was trying to reel in fish, okay? So he was a fisher of fish. Uh, yeah, fishing ministry, there we go. But it's great to have him back with us. Here's what I need to explain. Uh, the first offering is our regular church offering, all right? Uh, but at the end of the service, we will be having a second offering, all right? It's gonna be for the Actus family and their mission work in Uganda. I'm giving you this on the front end so I don't have to talk so much about it later, but here's the deal. Because I was in camp, I forgot to ask the staff to create some commitment cards, all right? We're not having to raise support for the Actus family. Their support, monthly support, is terrific. Isn't that good to hear after eight years on the field? All right, that's just wonderful. And you all are most of it, so thank you. Keep it up. Don't stop. 
all right? Or we'll have to have one of those Sundays. But you're going to hear about one of the ministries that we heard about a year and a half ago. It is booming, and they would like to do more with it. So when it comes to that offering at the end of the service, since I don't have any cards for you to do this on, here's what I'm asking that you do. You take one of the envelopes in the pew. You can write on it Actus. You can write on it Uganda. You can write on it Hope 58. Any one of those three things all going to the same thing. All right? And it's going to be going to that project you're going to hear Shelley talk about in a little while. And I'll follow up with, with that just a little bit. But here's the deal. You can either make the pledge. You can either make, give the gift today. You could bring it back tonight. You could just use that envelope as a pledge card and drop it in the offering and say, what this will mean is, by December the 31st, I will fulfill this pledge to the Actus Uganda Hope 58 project, okay? And so that would give you a couple of months, if you need to, to get that, uh, that gift into them. And so uh, that will be right at the end of the service after the message, okay? Is that clear as mud? Yeah. Good. Let's worship. And ushers, come forward. And I probably should pray. I'm really out of sync. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, I love you. Thank you for the life that you share with us. The life of your son, the Lord Jesus. The Christian life is not about us keeping a list of do's and don'ts. But Father, it's discovering what life with you is all about. It's learning that whatever it is that you ask of our life, or whatever it is you may even demand of our life, you are prepared to provide everything necessary to carry out those requests and those demands. Thank you. Father, you know the needs of those who've come today and what they are in need of. And so, uh, thank you for listening to their hearts. Father, thank you for those who maybe have no idea why they walked in here. And maybe it's to hear about what you're doing in Uganda. Or maybe it's to hear what your Bible has to say about eternity. But Father, thank you that they are here with us today. We trust you for all that we face in life. And we give you thanks in advance for your sufficiency. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When Matt and Shelley Actis and four little girls showed up at New Hope on that very first Sunday, as a pastor, you're always excited to see a family that large show up. Uh, it always helps attendance. And uh, <laughs> then they began to, uh, to say, hey, we, we, we want to be involved. And they got involved with our kids, and then they, they started a ministry to a homeless outreach. And then they began to say, we think God might be, might be calling us to something else. And over a period of months, that something else uh, began to be the mission field. And they began to look around. God, where do you want to send me? And, and I remember Matt telling the story multiple times. I told God, God, I will go anywhere except to Columbia. <laughs> and God sent them to Columbia. Uh, now, God wasn't going to leave them in Columbia, as we know a little bit of the rest of the story. But I think that was just God's way of tearing down the walls, of saying, hey, Wherever you want me is where I'm going to go. I don't care if it's across the street or across the nation or around the world. I'm willing to go. And so for four years, they served in Columbia. They planted a church there. And uh, Matt gave us a report just on Friday night when we had dinner together. That church is strong and it's thriving and that's great. And at the end of their four-year term, God unsettled their hearts about staying in Columbia. Normally you think if God sends you to a country, that's where you are. God began to say, nah, it, I just wanted you to learn Spanish, all right? Uh, uh, and now I'm going to send you to a place that has uh, over 20 languages inside its borders. And so God moved them to Uganda, Africa. And that's where they've been now for almost four years. And those little girls are not little anymore. And you're going to find out about what's going on with their family. But let's give a new hope, welcome home, welcome to Matt and Shelley Actis. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Would you notice they're starting to dress alike now that they've been in Africa for a while? We also wear this in Disneyland so we can find each other in the crowd. <laughs> Good morning, New Hope. Good I'm morning. Matt, and this is my lovely wife, Shelly, and we're so happy to be home and be worshiping with you this morning. Um, it just warms our heart um, to come back to the place where it all began. 
And we just celebrated our eighth year on the mission field. And so we just praise God for that. And um, we thank you, New Hope, because it was July 21st, 2010, when New Hope sent us off to the airport. And these little girls here, that picture is even old. The, the blonde ones in front are now taller than Shelly. And so they grow too fast, don't they? Um, we thought that that was the time in which God was really stretching us um, to surrender everything and go to Uganda. And we just found, we found out that God was actually just, just warming us up for stretching. And um, walking as missionaries, walking the Christian life as missionary has been a time of challenging and of stretching, but also has been a wonderful time of being surprised by God and all of the wonderful things that he does. Um, as New Hope missionaries, we are just an extension of New Hope Church in Uganda or Columbia or wherever we go. And I have to be honest, um, we have the benefit because we get front row seats of seeing what God is doing around the world um, because of you. So what we just want to take a moment and just, just say thank you um, so much. You support us with your prayers and you support us when we're here with your love and your hugs and it's your finances and your offerings and your tithes that keep us on the mission field and we've never lacked. And so we just want to thank you guys for that so much. This next time of stretching um, for us will be Lindsay staying here as she has just graduated from school. Um, since she probably won't stand up, she's the one wearing pants and the black shirt over there. <laughs> we did get her to wear a dress today, though. It's pretty good. And um, she just graduated from boarding school. She has been attending boarding school in Kenya, although we work in Uganda. That was another time of stretching, sending our kids to boarding school. At one time, we had all four there, and now Kennedy is back home. We're homeschooling her, so we're going to have one kid in Uganda, two kids in Kenya, and one kid in California. And so get ready for some more stretching, I think. As parents, we're still in denial. Um, it's probably going to be another tough season for us as we return to Uganda as a family of five. Um, just to share a bit about the work that the Lord has called us to do, um, I just felt on my heart to go and, and to teach pastors. And my, my background is teaching, my degree is in education. I was a school teacher in Clovis Unified for 10 years. And as I was looking for um, a place to do ministry, I was led by a, a fellow um, Ugandan pastor who took me out to these villages about an hour and a half drive away. And he said, in this area, these pastors don't have any um, Bible training. It's too far for them, and they don't have the finances to go to Bible college. And their, their education level is pretty low in that they're not very good readers as well. So even reading scripture and understanding scripture is difficult for them, and they've just learned orally, and it's an oral culture. So they, they remember things very well, what you say, and so they've just learned what people have told them. And that is a terrible way um, to learn the Bible and to preach it because all kinds of things get in there that aren't really biblical. And so as I began to teach with these pastors and ask them, how many of you guys have actually read through the New Testament from beginning to end? Very few, maybe 10%. And so I thought, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to sit down and we're going to read through Scripture together, beginning in Matthew. And as we began reading through, we began to find that there was a lot of, of bad doctrine. There's just a lot of misbeliefs about the Bible. Uh, one of them was they were saying, you see here people say that uh, Jesus is endorsing traditional beliefs. That's another way of saying witchcraft. And uh, no, he's not endorsing that. No, that would be incorrect. And... Um, <clears throat> Former pastors, the pastors who handed down the pulpit to the pastors in this current generation had told them, you don't need Bible training because the Holy Spirit will teach you all you need to know. It's in the Bible. And so they told me that and I said, well, let's just look that up. And it says, the Holy Spirit will remind you and teach you everything you need to know. It will remind you and teach you everything that I taught you words from Jesus, and therefore you first need to look and see what Jesus said to be reminded by the Holy Spirit what he taught you. And so since you haven't read the New Testament, maybe we'll begin there. And um, 
we just, you know, just seen a huge amount of transformation among pastors. And word got out that there was a guy coming out and teaching, me being the guy, coming out and teaching Bible to pastors. And I began getting invited to other villages and other villages and other villages. And right now I have six pastor training groups teaching over 100 pastors. And so we just praise God for that ministry. We just praise God for that ministry. Um, I didn't know that there would be such hunger for the word. And um, I just felt like um, I was going there to do one thing. You know, I'm going to go teach. And I just seen God just do a whole lot more. Instead of information, God's bringing about transformation among pastors. Churches we're not getting along previously are now working together to evangelize communities. And um, I would love to just sit and talk with you all day. But um, my wife also would like to say something to you, so I'm going to pass the microphone. Well, I just want to say good morning. Um, I think it's very special to be here today, to be amongst people that um, that know us and love us, um, who have been part of our story and a part of our journey. I see somebody from my mops days. I mean, how cool is that? When our kids were literally toddlers and so, so exciting. Um, so thank you for the warm welcome. Um, it means more than you'll ever, ever know. Um, like Matt said, it's been eight years of um, stretching us, teaching us new ways to surrender to the Lord. I, um, I felt like the big yes was saying yes to the, to the Lord to go to the mission field. And little did I know that God would ask us um, so, so much more than that. Part of that being sending our kids to boarding school. That was never in my plan, and yet it was in God's plan. And as um, we've watched the Lord work in each of their lives, each of our lives, we've seen God be faithful um, time and time again to, to that um, life of open hands and living a life um, in surrender. And so we've been so thankful for that. Um, but it's not been easy. It's been um, a challenging um, but fruitful ro road. And so we're just so blessed and thank you to have you along um, for it as part of our journey. I want to talk a little bit about um, the work that the Lord has led me to. I don't think that it's a, a coincidence that the Lord that gave me four beautiful daughters has given me a huge burden and a hole in my heart for village girls. Um, I don't believe that that's a coincidence at all. And so as I was moving around from village to village and hearing stories, um, listening, sitting with moms in the villages, hearing their cries, um, that they wanted something different for their daughters, um, different than, than what they had. And um, as a mom myself, I'm sure the, the Lord used use that to touch my heart um, for these girls. And I want to give girls um, some of the opportunities that my own daughters have had, do opportunities to, um, to, to be educated, to have skills necessary for life, to have parents that love them and cherish them and champion for them, for dreams to be realized. And so um, most, mo as, as maybe some of you know, maybe some of you do not, most um, village girls are not educated between 5th, 6th, 7th grade, um, giving them a low level of education and literacy rate. Um, oftentimes they are, they are married by 14 or 15 years of age. Shortly thereafter, they're having their first child. Um, it is not uncommon to, for a, a husband to tire of his wife and send her away. And then she's sent away with no education, um, no skills, and no way to provide for herself. Polygamy is still widely practiced throughout rural Uganda, so she might become a second or a third wife. These are the girls that end up in our schools, which I'll mention in just a moment. So. Hearing all of this um, and really putting it to prayer and asking the Lord, what is it that you want me to do? How do you see me entering in a part of these girls' story? Um, and I feel like the Lord has given me an opportunity to advocate for them and to be a voice for them. And, and he's given me that opportunity and that blessing. Um, we have done that through two years ago. Um, we started our first um, small school called New Life Skills Center. It's a program that we bring in the village girls. Um, it was it was very small in starting, but our, our hopes and our, our goals were to educate them and give them the life skills necessary to provide for themselves. So it's a one-year program where they, the first six months we spend working on um, 
the Bible. Obviously, we teach them the Bible. We teach them math, English, and health because we want them to have, to raise healthy families and be healthy moms. Um, and then the second part of our program, the second six months, um, they get to learn a vocation, a, a life skill such as hairdressing or tailoring. And then we also teach them business, um, the business skills necessary to go along with that. And so it's been really exciting. Um, two years ago, we started our first school um, with a lot of nerves and trepidation, not knowing what the Lord was going to do. And um, a year and a half ago, we stood here, and and after hearing lots and lots of um, requests, after we started that one school, requests for, for us to come and start new schools in new villages. And so I came before you a year and a half ago asking if you would help start a second school. Um, and God showed up big through you, New Hope. Um, and we were not only able to start another school, but then another school. So we currently have have three schools running. We have um, 16 Ugandan staff members. We have 69 girls who are currently getting educated and 77 who have graduated. So it's pretty exciting. Praise God. Um, and, and that's largely because of what you have um, enabled us to do. And so we just say thank you. Um, as if that's not enough, we just recently kicked off a new project. And it's a traveling drama team. We're using the girls themselves to travel around to communities and educate on some of the difficult, taboo um, topics, such as girl child education, early marriage, um, HIV prevention, and those sorts of things. And we do that through. Um, because, as Matt said, they're an oral culture. They love song and dance and storytelling. Um, so we do that in a very culturally relevant way through storytelling and drama and dance. And we were able to also um, purchase a, a vehicle for them just recently. So it's been really exciting to see... Um, them actually have a voice, a voice in their community, and they're, they're reaching out and teaching um, the people. So that our hope is that, th that more and more girls will be educated, and it will work on the prevention end, not just on the pickup end. Um, so we're really excited to see how, um, how God is, is blessing the ministry and um, expanding. So that's been really exciting. We're going to show you in just a moment. We have a video. You're going to get to meet um, to to a pastor and a and a girls whose lives have been impacted through you. Um, one of them has give, recently given her life to Christ, so she's now a sister in Christ, which is very exciting. And you have all been a part um, of her story and her journey. So we'd like you to meet Heja and Maxwell. Thank you. So we're headed out to the village right now. We're going to visit um, New Life Skills Center in Bugosere, um, where we're going to visit with one of our graduates. We'll meet with Hija, and you'll get to hear a little bit about her story. And then we're also going to talk with Maxwell, um, one of the pastors that, that Matt has trained, um, and hear a little bit about the impact that that's made in his life as well. My text <laughs> <laughs> I'm an assistant teacher. Era nazala mu myaka ya chito. Nali ngandi soma emisomo jange jabanga jiteteganiwa. Nako banja kuba mama aye buti. Ovuna nziwa ni nabo ayo omwana buti njya ko lanti omwana. Ngandi ndi community tikasobola kufuna wantu wona wona nga kuba nsiba mu maziga kuba ngandi ndi ndi omukisa gwange gwako ma. Okuido kubanga nsoma New Life Skill Center Zena na akabaire ngole muna ange Yaji ya ye tunda ya loza nchi okue tunda nukurunji Ato ukumaliza ya maliza nga kinyesha hivi Nabuti nga zekanti Jesus kuba nali musiramu Nga katonda gotu ogera ku ni Jesus Kacholo idano matani kwa kusoma baibo baibo I'm 
Maxwell. I graduated in personal training program and I'm now a personal trainer. Before the training, I had, uh, I, was, I had pastored for 13 years. Reading and interpreting the Bible was very hard to me. I was not prepared. Churches were disunited. There, is no, there was no relationship between pastors. His training has assisted me to come closer to my uh, fellow pastors. As I've been going through the training, I understand that the work is not mine, but the work is for the Lord. And the church is not mine, it is for the Lord. These people are God's people, not my people, as I used to think. This training is going to transform Uganda in the way that it's going to, to bring unity among the pastors and we become one church in the whole of Uganda. May God bless you abundantly. The uh, Grief Share sign up clipboard showed up, so I'm going to send it around now. If you are interested in taking Grief Share starting August the 28th through December the 4th, once a week, uh, they meet from 9 30 to 11 30 in the morning. All right, uh, that's on Tuesdays. And if you can't make a daytime but, but are interested in an evening one, please sign at the bottom and then we're going to work out a schedule for you there. All right, so that's the Grief Share sign up. Um, wow. Matt and Shelley, thank you so very much. Let's, uh, let's talk just a moment about, um, about the school. All right, uh, you started with one. After you here the last time, you were able to start two more because of the funds that were raised here. We hope for one more. We got two more, so that was good. And you're ready to start another one? How many more could you start if you had the resources? Easily three or four more. Okay, all right. So here's the deal. Here's what I already know. Between the 8 o'clock service and the 9.15 service, we've already raised enough for one. Okay? So we're on our way towards the second one. So, um, so between this service and tonight's service, let's, let's see if we can't knock out one more. All right? So that would be at least two that you could go back home and start already. Um, you see, it teaches them education, but what I love is the part that it teaches them a career, an occupation. They can begin to do hair. Uh, did they make that shirt you're wearing? Yes, they did. So that's the kind of work that they do, all right, is what you saw both Matt and Shelly wearing today, and they're able to sell those uh, in their villages and in their communities. And so instead of turning to prostitution, instead of turning to drugs, instead of turning to a life of crime, they have a way to carry on with life. And it's one that brings them a great deal of respect. And so um, all of us cannot go, but all of us can carry out the Great Commission. And so as we have the Matt and Shelleys who can go, the rest of us here, we give so they can go. So thank you all for being here. You can follow up with them at 2, 3, and 4 o'clock, ice cream. And you can come back at 5 o'clock tonight. If you can't make it in the afternoon, come back at 5 o'clock right here in the sanctuary. And uh, you're going to be able to hear much more in-depth and do some Q&A with Matt and Shelley this evening. So we hope you'll come back. There will be an offering at the end of this service. So our ushers know to be ready for that offering. Hopefully they remember that from the last service. And uh, whether you give or put in a pledge envelope, all right, today, drop that in and we will get it counted up and we will know by this evening where we are and all of that. Uh, since the beginning of summer, we started a sermon series on what subject? Yeah. Heaven. It's called What's Up With Heaven. Uh, Heaven is this place that we all talk about. It's a place we say we want to go to, but none of us are ever in a hurry to get there. Uh, we have lots of questions, and sometimes those questions are very serious questions about heaven. And so uh, we decided we would do a series, and we started the first couple of weeks with you all giving some input with questions. What are the kind of questions you have about heaven? And so over the weeks during the summer, we've been looking in, in the scriptures and finding answers to those questions. There are some questions we will have about heaven. We will not get answers to until we get there. We just won't be able to understand it all. But there is a lot in the Bible that tells us about heaven. One of the things that we discovered very early on in this sermon series is there's something that has to happen before we go to heaven. What is it? 
you got to die first. Uh, that's the part that scares most of us. And so we actually spent a couple of weeks looking at the subject of death and dying. The reality is every one of in this room, I don't care how young you are, some of our uh, high school graduate students over there, I don't care how young you are or how old you are, like my dad who was 93 years old, someday we're going to die. We might not live to be 93. We might not live to be 53. We might not live to be 33. Fact is, we could live to be 103. But at some point, we're all going to die. That's the doorway to eternity. And so we spent a little time looking at the subject of death because what I've discovered in doing hospice work for almost, uh, almost uh, 30 years is that a lot of people, even believers in Jesus Christ, are afraid when it comes to dying. Now, I have also discovered that sometimes it's not the dying they're worried about, it's how they die. It's the process sometimes that you go through. And I understand that. Cancer, various diseases, all kinds of things can, can make that process very horrible. But for us as believers, I think if we know the truth well enough, and know the biblical principles that apply to this, we can have a bit of an attitude like Paul did, all right? And that there was this sense of expectation. I don't know whether I want to live longer and stay with family and friends and share the grace of Jesus Christ with others or whether I'm just ready to go on to be with heaven. It was this thing that these are two good choices, not two bad choices. And so we spent a little time looking at that. And so as we look at the subject of heaven, we come across some other things that we also have to investigate. Last week, we looked at the question, do people in heaven know what's going on with us on earth? And that's a really good question. I mean, I have every great confidence that my mother, my grandmother, my grandparents, my grandfathers are in heaven. And you sometimes wonder, hey, hi guys. Things, how do you think I'm doing? And so we looked at some scriptures. Do we know for sure if they know what's going on? So last week we looked at two primary passages of scripture. We looked at Hebrews chapter 12, which comes after Hebrews 11. Isn't that brilliant? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but Hebrews chapter 11 is known as the Hall of Fame of Faith. It's a brief history of the Old Testament saints and those who had faith that Jesus was coming someday and they lived and taught and preached and proclaimed that message of a coming Messiah. And in the coming Messiah is where they had placed their faith. And their names are listed there. And, 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 and then we get to chapter 12. And it's a continuation of chapter 11 and it says, We are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. There's this idea that those who've gone on before us are cheerleading for us. They're, they're standing on the sideline rooting for us. And then we looked at some other scriptures that there's great rejoicing that goes on in heaven when one person repents and becomes a believer in Jesus Christ. And then we looked at the story that Jesus himself told on earth about the rich man and the poor man the rich man and Lazarus. And then on this world, the rich man had everything that he wanted and he didn't want God. And the poor man had God and didn't even have the things that he needed. And they both died and they went to separate places in eternity. One to a place of torment and one to a place of blessedness. It's found in Luke chapter 16. And there was some dialogue that took place between the two of them. They couldn't meet each other. They couldn't touch each other. They couldn't assist each other because the scripture says there's this great gulf between them, but yet there was an awareness. And so from those things, we made some conclusions last week. But it also introduced that for us to believe in heaven, there also is this matter of hell we've got to deal with. So today we're going to start a discussion about hell and we'll wrap it up next week. And that's dangerous for me to announce in advance that I'm going to preach about hell. Most people don't like that subject. Many of us live our lives like Elaine's boyfriend in Seinfeld. Do you all remember Elaine? You remember Seinfeld? Great program. You might remember this dialogue. Elaine asked her boyfriend on one occasion, do you believe in God? And her boyfriend says, yes I do, very much. And Elaine responds, well, is that a problem for you that I'm not religious? And he said, no problem for me. That seemed to bother Elaine. And Elaine says, how come it's not a problem for you? And his reply was, I'm not the one going to hell. <laughs> now, 
I got to admit, when I read that the first time, and then I actually went and found the clip, and I thought about showing it today, and for the sake of time, I didn't. Um, everybody laughs. I laughed. You all just laughed as I told it. And yet it really is sad. You see, he must have not liked her all that much. Because wouldn't it bother you if somebody you loved was going to hell? The only reason it wouldn't is if you don't believe there is one. This whole subject of hell has fallen on very, very hard times in the last 25 years. You see, it used to be that the vast majority of Christians, at least, regardless of their faith background, denominational connections, believed that hell was a real place where the wicked and the unrepentant would go when they died. The very thought of the pains and the torments of a place like hell was enough to scare sinners straight. It used to be that pastors of the gospel would preach on occasions the horrors of hell in order to persuade reprobates to a point of repentance. It doesn't happen much anymore. If you'll all recall, about four or five years ago, I preached a short sermon series on the subject of hell, and I said I had to apologize because it had been over a decade since I'd even touched the subject of hell. And yet, if I say I'm a pastor of the gospel of Jesus Christ of this book, hell is here. It's found in here. All of us should know what the possibilities are. Most American mainline and so-called evangelical churches stopped preaching on this subject decades ago. And most mainline pastors stopped believing in hell years before that. You see, hell makes people uncomfortable. Hell has become too old-fashioned for the 21st century. The topic of hell is bad for the bottom line in churches. Attendance drops and income goes lower. Some have said that hell has damaged people's self-esteem. Well, heavens, we wouldn't want to do that. So I guess everybody with a high self-esteem is going to be in hell. Hell's been retained in our modern dictionaries and lexicons as a convenient cuss word and as a metaphoric description of our worst experiences in life. For example, we say things like, war is hell. Or we say, I went through hell last week. Or we even tell somebody, go to H-E double candlesticks. That's the way preacher's kids learn to swear, all right? We didn't really say the word. But hardly anybody today believes that the word hell corresponds to this objective reality of eternity. Many have concluded the fact that we have gotten so smart there's no need for hell anymore. According to the U.S. News and World Report, 78% believed in heaven and believed they were going there. Only 60% of the people interviewed believed in hell, and only 4% of them believed they were going there. In that same article, a pastor, Reverend Mary Krause, observed, my congregation would be stunned to hear a sermon on hell. She goes on to say, my congregation are upper middle class, well-educated, critical thinkers who view God as a compassionate and loving person, not someone who's going to push them into eternal damnation. I am glad she was never my pastor. You see, God is loving and compassionate. It's why he sent his son to the cross to die for all of our sins. You see, God understands the tragedy of hell and that's why he was willing to, to pay an extreme high cost to prevent anybody from going there. God does not push anybody into hell. In fact, because of the cross, he does his best to pull everybody out of hell. Since we investigated Luke chapter 16 last week and a few other passages, it appears that believers in heaven are aware of some faith commitments of those that are made on earth. And so other questions come into our mind. Will those same heavenly believers lament the eternal destruction of others? And if so, how could anybody ever be happy in heaven knowing that people they cared about are spending eternity in hell? 
And we'll look a little closer at that question next week. But before I address that one, there are some other truths about hell that I think we need to understand. First off, hell is necessary. That's hard to get our head around, but hang with me for a couple of minutes. You see, hell was not part of God's original creation design. It didn't exist in the beginning. In the beginning, God created what? The heavens and the earth. And when God created all of that, what did he say about it? It was good. And then he went on to say it was very good. But then Satan rebelled. And then when Satan rebelled, he then enlisted the first couple, Adam and Eve, in a coup against the Almighty God, and hell became a necessity. One of my favorite pastor authors of all time is a guy by the name of Warren Wearsby. I, I just looked Warren up this past week because I really thought he was dead. He's probably happy to know that I was wrong. <laughs> Warren is still alive. He's, he's 92 years old. He's just a year younger than dad. But Warren Wiersbe at one time pastored Moody Bible Church in Chicago when it was over 10,000. Warren Wiersbe has been an author of over 150 books. He wrote his first book as a teenager on magic tricks. <laughs> and then he started writing about Jesus. He has an entire set of commentaries called the B Bible Series. And uh, if you're ever looking for some really good books on the Bible, I would recommend any of them by Warren Wiersbe. Listen to what this very smart man said about hell. He said, hell is a witness to the righteous character of God. It's the righteousness of God that requires him to judge sin. Hell is also a witness to man's responsibility. The fact that we are not a robot or a helpless victim, but we are a creature able to make choices. God does not send people to hell they send themselves by rejecting the Savior. Hell is also a witness to the awfulness of sin. If we saw just once sin as God sees it, we would understand why a place like hell exists. Satan's purpose in this world is both simple and sinister. He uses every means available to undermine and to destroy God's plans and God's truth for this world. And because every human being since the fall of that first couple in the Garden of Eden have been infected by the sin virus, Satan has millions of willing accomplices to aid him in his efforts. In, in, in Uganda, it gets so far to where there's still witch doctors that exist in the village to lead people astray. I found it in the Ivory Coast on my trips there. In fact, we had a witch doctor come through the village of uh, the village that we sponsor called Neonan in Ivory Coast. And while we were there preaching to the kids at VBS, the witch doctor shows up and starts dancing around and acting like a crazy man to distract everybody. That happened two years in a row, but over the years... Most of that village have now come, become believers and the witch doctor had to take his practice to another village because no one believed in him anymore. But there's all kinds of folks out there that create terrible conditions for our world. Why do our cities suffer with prostitution and gang warfare and drug abuse? Because humanity makes bad choices. It's not our dogs and our cats that make bad choices, that make our cities bad. It's the owners of those dogs and those cats who make bad choices. Why do our corporations and governments struggle with things like lying and cover-ups and corruption? Why are families being destroyed by adultery and pornography and abuse? Why do churches split over such issues as the style of worship, pastoral personalities, and the pressure to be culturally relevant? These are just some of the devastating consequences of rebelling against Christ. But this rebellion will not last forever. One day the universe will be restored to this original place of perfection. Evil will no longer triumph or even exist. But for that to happen, those who have refused God's love will be quarantined from believers in the afterlife. If unbelievers were not isolated in hell from the rest of God's new creation, evil would once again infect God's creation. What do we mean by this word hell when we toss it out there? 
Um, word studies are very interesting in the Bible. Uh, it's one of the things I'm sure that Matt is, is exploring with these pastors, is how do you decipher Old Testament, New Testament. Uh, quick, quick lesson here. Old Testament was written in what language? Hebrew. Okay. New Testament was written in what language? Greek. Good. All right. So we have two languages used to write the New Testament. Hebrew and Greek. Is Hebrew and Greek like English? No, it's not even close. Not even close. If I were to hand you a Hebrew Bible, or if I were to hand you a Greek Bible, most of you in this room could not read either one. I could only read small portions of the Greek New Testament. And I've forgotten most of what I learned in Bible college about that. Those languages are so very different. One example, and I had the privilege of kind of sharing this analogy with a group of our kids up at camp this week. One of the days at camp, uh, th there were four different activities that four different groups, the camp was divided into four different teams, and each day a team did a different activity. One day it was some um, grunt work, okay? Uh, another day it was... Um, uh, uh, oh, oh, it was the, the um, yeah, the rope course, okay? The rope course. And uh, I learned something about myself that day. I love the song we sang today, I'm No Longer a Slave to Fear, okay? And, and I'm, th th I, I have to be honest, it's not because I'm a big, brave guy, uh, but there aren't very many things that scare me anymore in life. Um, and the height of the ropes course didn't scare me. I'm attached to a line. If I fell off a line, how far was I going to fall? About that far. Okay? Now, I'm a long ways off the ground, but I'm attached to this line. Uh, we also paid money to do this. Okay? Um, they, they, they're concerned about their insurance liabilities, so they're not going to do things that people are going to get injured on. So, I was, But you know what I discovered in our, um, our, our, our uh, what, what do we call it up there, guys? After an event we did, debriefing. In our debriefing, I, I discovered I was scared of something. I was scared as a 63-year-old man to look stupid in front of 17-year-old guys. <laughs> I was determined to finish it. And I did. Here's what I did. I finished it so fast, I really didn't get to enjoy the experience. Because for me, the goal was to get to the end not to enjoy the process. So many of us, I think, in life, we just want to make sure we're okay at the end and we don't enjoy life and life more abundant. So, in one of the classes, one of the days, it was library day. And so they took our group up the hill to the library. The library was a patio that had been built on the side of the hill. There were no walls. There was just a tent top. But there was a door to enter the library. Now, no walls, but a door, all right? And, and so we all go inside the library and, and uh, our pawn for the day gave us the directions, gave us a scripture verse that all the kids were to read and gave them five questions. And there were books on the shelf in the library, Bible dictionaries, Bible concordances, and all kinds of things that they could do the research in. And then they were to get together as a small group, answer the questions again, and then the big group would come together and do a whole review of this and see what we had learned and discovered by putting tools uh, of Bible study to practice as we read the Bible. Well, the group that I was responsible just to answer questions, not to teach them, but just to be there to uh, assist, uh, they were struggling with how to find out a definition of a word. And they looked it up in the concordance, which a concordance doesn't really define a word, but it gives you where it's listed in the Bible. And they couldn't find that, that, that Greek uh, word in, in the Greek New Testament because it's in alphabetical order to the Greek language, not the English language. And so they said, what do we do? Well, I went back to my old Bible college days and I said, here's how you use a concordance. And in a Strong's concordance, you can look up the word love. And you will find every time the word love is used in the Bible, hundreds of times. If it's in the Old Testament, it'll give you the scripture reference. And after the scripture reference, it'll give you a number. And what you do is you look that number up. What language was the heat was? I just told you. <laughs> so, you, if it's in the Old Testament, you go back to the dictionary in the back of the book that's in Hebrew and you look up the number. 
Not the language, not the spelling in Hebrew or English, but you look it up by number, it tells you the Hebrew word, gives you the English equivalent, then it gives you a little definition. If the scripture reference is in, in the New Testament, you go back to the Greek dictionary in the back of the book, look up the number, it will give you the Greek word, the English equivalent, and a brief definition. That definition wasn't enough for all these kids. And so there was a big thick book there that was the Greek New Testament dictionary. Again, it's in Greek. But the number system from the Strong's Concordance works in that book. And so if you find the number in the Strong's, you go to this book and now it gives you a very thorough definition. Now what we found out is there are some words in Greek that they had multiple words that we translate as the same word in our English vocabulary. And sometimes that's really confusing. For example, the word love. Shelly's not here like she was last service. But Shelly, I love you. For me to say, I love you, to Shelly, and then to look over at John and say, John Realhorn, I love you. Do you think I mean the same thing when I say that to John as when I say it to Shelly? You better say no. <laughs> okay? Though both sentences are true. I love Shelly. I love John. The word, uh, the, the city Philadelphia, you all know what that city name means, don't you? City of brotherly love. Did you know that that comes from Greek? Phileo is brotherly love. Phileo, Philadelphia, okay, city of brotherly love. That's from the Greek language. Very different than agape love. Agape is a Greek word. That's what's translated for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There is the love of God. Agape. There is brotherly love, the kind of love that Tim and John have for each other. There is an affectionate kind of love that a husband and a wife have for each other. And then, I probably shouldn't go here, but I will. Then there is the word eros. Do you know what word we get in our English language from eros? Erotica. <laughs> That's triple X kind of love, okay? But you see, we talk about, hey, we made love last night. That's an entirely different word. And so sometimes we have to know the background of these words. The same thing is true about this word hell. There are multiple words in the New Testament particularly, multiple words in the Old Testament, each one of them give us a little different understanding of what hell is like. And we are going to take a closer look at that next Sunday. Let me throw out this one last thing and we'll wrap it up. It may or may not surprise you to know that the person in the Bible who spoke the most often and in the most graphic of terms about hell was not one of the Old Testament fiery prophets like Elijah. It wasn't even John who wrote the book of Revelation in the New Testament. But the one who spoke most often and most graphic about hell was Jesus himself. Eleven out of twelve times that the word Gehenna, which is the most graphic Greek word to describe hell, eleven of the twelve times that it's used, it's Jesus is the one who uses it. And you'll find out why next Sunday. But if Jesus had so much to say, in fact, Jesus talked about hell more often than Jesus talked about heaven. So you and I, we need to have a balanced understanding of heaven and hell. One day, when Vice President Calvin Coolidge was presiding over the Senate. Anybody here remember when Calvin Coolidge was Vice President? <laughs> One senator angrily told another senator, You need to go straight to hell. And we think our current politicians aren't very nice to each other. They, they weren't very nice then either. The offended senator complained to Coolidge as the presiding officer. Coolidge looked up from the book that he had been leafing through while the debate was going on, and he wittingly replied to that senator, I've looked in the rule book, sir. You don't have to go if you don't want to. <laughs> but some folks don't know they don't have to. Adrian Rogers, a Southern Baptist pastor, author, and for many years was the president of that large denomination. He recalled hearing about a nightclub in his town that was named the Gates of Hades. 
The story goes there was a newcomer in the city who was looking for this nightclub and he stopped a police officer one evening to ask directions to the gates of Hades. It just so happened that a block away from that nightclub there was a church and the name of the church was Calvary Church. And when the man asked the police officer for directions, the cop replied, if you want to get to the gates of Hades, you have to go past Calvary. <laughs> and folks, if you go to hell, you have to go by the cross and ignore it. If you go to hell, you have to deny the prophecies that were over 800 to 1,200 years old were not all fulfilled in the life of one man whose name was Jesus Christ. You will have to deny the virgin birth of a babe in Bethlehem and that 33 years later he died on a cross and three days later he rose again from the dead and 2,000 years later the world has still never been the same. If you go to hell... It's not because God pushes you there, but it's because you chose to go. For you, I know most of you, not all of you, but most of you. Here's my concern for us. How many of us are like Elaine's boyfriend? We really don't care because we're not the ones going to hell. We need to care. We care enough to fund the Actus family to go two-thirds of the way around the world and share the gospel with people you and I will never meet this side of heaven. Are we willing to walk across the street or down a hallway in our own home and share our incredible love and faith in Jesus Christ? You don't have to preach hell, fire, and brimstone. But you do need to share the love of Christ with those who someday, if they don't embrace the love of Jesus Christ, they will experience hell, fire, and brimstone. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, there are harsh realities in life and there are harsh realities in Scripture. And that's why I think my, one of my favorite words in all of the Bible is the word grace. Grace is what prevents the harsh realities of being the determining factors of our eternal life. Grace is giving to us a life we don't deserve. Grace is making it a free gift. It's nothing we can earn or buy. It's grace motivated by your love that extends to us not only a, quant a qu quantity of life in eternity, but also a quality of life of peace and joy and contentment and satisfaction in this world. It's this whole idea of love and grace that comes from you that provides a way of escape of the penalties and the punishment that come with sin. So Father, I pray that this balanced perspective of both heaven and hell will give us the right initiative to want to share what we have been so graciously provided and share it with others. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll finish hell next week. <laughs> once and for all, I hope. And uh, actually, not once and for all that I'll never preach on it again, but once and for all that you don't ever have to worry about going there again. Uh, two, three, and four. Uh, village encounter and ice cream. Five o'clock, evening service. Ushers, come forward. I, they're there. They're coming. Ushers, come forward. All right. Uh, who do I have in here? Uh, Milo left me. Who do I have in here that can... Where's, where's one of my singers? Come on up. Come on, Mar Marguerite. Uh, we're going to sing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I tried uh, Oh, How I Love Jesus, and nobody remembered the words last service. So we'll do Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. Let's sing. Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound.